Welcome to Royal Haunts and the sixth and final part of the House of Stuart and the Commonwealth. Whether a usurper or not, Mary and her husband undertook the offer to fight for the crown of England, Scotland and Ireland. There wasn't much fight in the people, though some did support James, especially Scotland, who didn't want a foreign king and an English parliament running their country. It left James a king without kingdom, as his brother before him, with James seeking exile, learning from his father's mistake, though it's unlikely that James would have had such a public execution as Charles I. After all, deposed kings had been incarcerated before, dying at the hands of their jailers. What became known as a glorious revolution saw the first and only joint rule, this was one of the demands William made. He wasn't prepared to be a consort, and laws from the reign of Mary I had to be changed to suit the situation. In return, Mary and William transferred many of the powers of the Crown to Parliament, one being that it chose a successor with a veto on Catholics, making James the last Catholic monarch. William and Mary's marriage wasn't a happy one, and Mary didn't produce any living heirs up to her death five years into the reign. It was obvious that William was not going to remarry, with a preference for male company, though he had continued a long-standing affair with Elizabeth Villiers up to his wife's death, she being a cousin of Barbara Villiers, one of the famous mistresses of Charles II. William's reign was taken up in the wars with France, where his father-in-law resided in exile. He put down the futile rebellions in Ireland that saw James' last hope of regaining his kingdom, and the Jacobite rebellions after their success at the Battle of Kilcrankey. James could have been welcomed back, as King of Scotland at least, if the Viscount of Dundee hadn't been killed in the battle rallying the Scots to the Stuart cause that brought Scotland together. The battle site at Kilcranky is still said to remember the fallen, with phantom soldiers from both sides being seen, along with a red glowing light. And as with other battles, it is said to replay in the skies over the actual battlefield. Throughout his thirteen-year reign, William III weeded out the Jacobite supporters as traitors to the crown, seizing lands and property. In one instance, Sir John Fenwick was accused of plotting against the king. Though he denied the charges, he was found guilty, and being a noble was beheaded at Tower Hill. The crown took Fenwick's property, including a horse that became William's favourite mount, and it was through this horse, White Sorrel, that William came about his death. Riding through the grounds of Hampton Court, the horse stumbled on a molehill, throwing William and breaking his collarbone. When pneumonia set in, William was done for, passing away at Richmond Palace, leaving his wife's sister to become Queen Anne. With the death of James II, his son was recognised as King by France, leaving hope for Scotland to have their own King and Parliament, and so the Jacobite cause continued. William had never liked his brother-in-law, George of Denmark, and during his reign a rift led to Anne and George forming their own circle of friends away from court. William didn't publicly recognise Anne as successor, but that was now left to Parliament, and after Mary's death did not leave her as regent during his absences as would be appropriate. It's said that William tried to negotiate with the son of James II, even though he had denounced James Queen, as did Mary, preferring to believe the baby had been swapped, offering the young man his crown in exchange for him to recant his Catholic faith and worship under the Church of England. James Francis Edward Stuart refused. Anne was the fourth queen to rule England in her own right, her husband had supported William in the Glorious Revolution, though Anne remained in contact with her father, and especially her half-sister Louise, who had been born in exile. Unlike William, George of Denmark was less ambitious for the crown, keeping in the background until Anne's accession, when he took up the post of Lord I. Admiral. The marriage was successful, as George was chosen for her in the use of political matches among the royal bargaining chips, 
though at the time of her marriage Charles II was near the end of his reign, with James and her elder sister before her. Anne was just as unlucky as her sister Mary, if not more so, when it came to producing a hair. Anne gave birth to a son who looked set to one day be king when Mary died, leaving no issue. William, who was invested as Duke of Gloucester, enjoyed his eleventh birthday party, but later complained of feeling ill. Taking to a sick bed, he died six days later. He left Parliament having to look for the next successor without Catholic leanings, leading them to look further afield. Although there were candidates with strong claims, the Anti-Catholic Act now barred them from taking the throne. Parliament looked back to James I of England in the line of the second child, his daughter Elizabeth. She had been married off to the Palpatine electorate who supported Charles I during the Civil War. Elizabeth's daughter, Sophia, was invited to take the succession over what Jacobites saw as the rightful monarch in the son of James II. By this time, Sophia was getting on in years, and when she died just months before Queen Anne, her son took automatic right. A practice began by Edward the Confessor was the touching of the king against the disease now called scrofula, which was then widely known as the king's evil. Edward the Confessor was said to have cured many sufferers by touch alone, which became associated with the true monarch. It was a practice encouraged by James I, with the restoration of Charles II seeing him giving the touch to thousands of sufferers, more than any other monarch before him. The royal touch was abandoned by William III, refusing anyone with the request though there may have been other reasons, as James II was still very much alive. Queen Anne restored the royal touch, taking this duty very seriously, with prayers and a 24-hour fasting period, Anne being the last monarch to do this. A rather strange legend came from a statue that can be seen at Queen Anne's Gate in London. It isn't the first time that tales of inanimate objects have been said to come to life, and this is what the statue is reputed to do. At one time children threw stones at it, thinking it was Mary the First, or Bloody Mary, as the Tudor propaganda machine worked against her. It was only when the statue was cleaned that the inscription read that it was Queen Anne. However, the legend still persists that the statue removes itself from its plinth to go for an evening stroll, giving the most prevalent date as August the 1st, this being the anniversary of the Queen's death. The death of Queen Anne brought an end to the Stuart dynasty with a new and very foreign monarchy.